Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and uh, as you know, this is uh, Shackleton, and I've got a little toy for him. I've got an old mouse here for him to uh, play around with, so let's see what he does here. Okay, come on. Come on. Come on. No, he's got other ideas tonight, so... Uh, Anyway, I wanted to follow up on my video on hardwiring happiness, okay? So, the latest in neuroscience seems to indicate um, that the brain is a lot more pliable than we think. A lot of people have this misconception that, um, sure, your brain is changing a lot when you're a baby, growing up, you know, learning new things. Then when you get to be an adult, uh, you know, you're pretty much uh, fixed. Nothing could be uh, further from the truth, actually. Um, the the uh, field of neuroplasticity is learning all kinds of uh, new things about the power of people to actually change the wiring, the hard wiring in their brain. So your mind, which sits inside the brain, which is a manifestation of all of the inner workings of the brain, can actually, you can direct your thoughts to change the wiring of the brain. And then that changed wiring of the brain will then feed back and change the mind and your mind and attitude about things. So, so in order to, there's an acronym H-E-A-L. So if you have a, um, positive experience and you enrich it and ad and adapt it and then you can link it to negative thoughts negative experiences or thoughts of them you can actually rewire the brain if you think of the brain as a garden with flowers some flowers flowers is a good experiences and because of the negative bias of the brain um, then those um, there's a lot more weeds than flowers in the garden. So this um, technique heal can actually pull weeds out and replace them with flowers, um, metaphorically, or is the idea. Okay, so I'm going to get right into showing you some of the diagrams and so on, because in the last video I talked a lot about things. Oh, by the way, you can see... The, uh, my, my flowers in this room are doing much better. Um, they've actually been watered recently, and I went through and removed all of the uh, dead foliage. Okay, so this is an um, image here showing the anatomy and functional areas of the brain. I'm not going to go into all of the uh, specific uh, details um, of this diagram, um, but I will talk a little bit about the evolution of the brain and the regions uh, like the amygdala and the hypothalamus and the um, hippocampus that are very important for, for uh, emotions. And uh, you know, they're sort of the some of the they're, they're some of the earliest fundamental parts of the brain that during the evolutionary cycle, and they're still there and uh, they affect us. So this is specifically geared to people that are having more and more people that look at climate change around the world, rapid climate change, are undergoing um, climate anxiety or eco-anxiety um, because everything seems to be happening faster than comp we can comprehend and there's huge changes to the climate system and people are having horrible deaths, for example, most recently in California. You know, there's massive floods. Everything seems to be unstable in the climate system. So how does one deal with that, whether you're a climate scientist or a climate activist, if you like, or, you know, anybody, you know, if you live on the planet, how do you, how do you deal with these massive changes? You know, before, if you wanted to see a different um, part of the world, a different climate, a different... Um, uh, situation you'd have to travel and now you know you can just wait where you are and the world is changing where you are okay so like I mentioned the um, okay so 
Okay, here we go. Okay, so I mentioned this book here. Okay, Hardwiring Happiness. This was published in 2013 by Rick Hansen. Rick Hansen is a he's a neuroscientist and he's written a number of books and you can read, you know, have a look at his bio. He's got a website rickhansen.net and you can have a look at the uh at his bio and so this is his most recent book resilient how to grow an unshakable core of calm strength and happiness okay i haven't read got that book or read it yet um it's 2018 published in 2018 um i will get it i'm just about finished reading not quite finished reading the um hardwiring happiness and i haven't read these previous ones but Buddha's brain also looks uh, quite interesting. So just to remind you of some of the science of the brain, perhaps the most complex object in the universe. Although your brain is just three pounds of soft, gushy, tofu-like tissue, it has about 1.1 trillion cells. Okay, million is 10 to the power of six, or one with six zeros, billion, 10 to the power of nine, or one with nine zeros, um, trillion, 10 to the 12th, or one with 12 zeros. So it's 1.1 trillion cells in the brain. Now, about a trillion of those are support cells. They're not uh, neurons, they're not neural cells. So 0.1 trillion, or 100 billion, are neurons. Now, each of these neurons, if you think of these neurons as the nodes here, each of these nodes is connected to many other neurons. So the number of connections on average for each neuron is about 5,000 connections, which is an enormous number of connections for each one. So you can see the interconnectivity is huge. The connections are through synapses, which are actually gaps and in order for the electrical signal to go across the gaps, it's, uh, they're carried by effectively by these neurotransmitters, if you like, like dopamine and things like that. So basically, it's like we have 500 trillion microprocessors wired together in a vast network, one microprocessor per node. When a neuron fires, that excites or inhibits receiving neurons. Okay, so you need to sum all of the electrical signals that a neuron receives, and if it's above a certain predetermined value called a threshold, the neuron will, will fire. And if it's below that threshold, the neuron won't fire. So it's like the dominant message. If everybody, you know, it's like a whole bunch of people are, are yelling in a crowd. Uh, in a crowd of people, they're yelling, go, or they're yelling, stop. Right? If the noise level gets above a certain uh, amplitude, then you could say, okay, go, the neuron fires. Okay, so, so basically, uh, you know, it's a very complex system, like the climate system. And if you take all of the possible combinations of 100 billion neurons firing or not, the number of potential states is 10 to the millionth power. 10 to the millionth power, one followed by a million zeros. Okay, now considering there's only 10 to the 80th power of atoms in the universe, the number of possibilities, the number of different states, different states of your brain are just mind boggling, if you like. Um, and the neurons are firing five to 50 times a second with millions and even billions of them are pulsing together. Okay, so, um, you know, and, and if you clap your hands in the half second it takes you to clap your hand, billions of synapses have activated in your brain. Okay, so most brain activity is lightning fast and it's outside of our awareness. Okay, the slower stuff that we call thoughts and feelings is just the observable tip of an, of an iceberg of lightning quick electrical, chemical, and possibly quantum activities. Okay, the electrical signal goes up through the neuron uh, there's chemical neurotransmitters taking the signal from the dendrites, uh, the tentacles, if you like, of one neuron to the axon 
of another neuron, and then the electrical conduction up, possibly quantum activities. You know, the idea of a threshold the thing is either firing or not firing. That's a quantum type uh, activity. Now, we've had three and a half billion years of evolution. And our DNA is 98 to 90%, 9% identical to chimpanzee DNA. That 1% to 2% difference is mostly in the brain, and it's mostly um, in the, how the brain functions. Okay, so more than learning how to use tools, more than adapting to moving out of the forest into the grasslands of Africa, it's learning to love, live with each other that drove recent human evolution. The brain is always on, okay, like a humming refrigerator, billions of neurons firing every minute to keep your body alive and ready for urgent needs. The brain is only, you know, like we said at the beginning, it's, uh, where is it? Three pounds of tofu-like tissue. So alone it's only three pounds. It's only two to three percent of your body weight. It uses 20 to 25 percent of the oxygen and glucose that circulates in your blood. So it's an energy hog, an energy pig if you like, and an oxygen hog and pig. So basically the mind is what the brain does, okay? Um, it's a net result. Um, it's much harder to sort of narrow it down to, to one point. I mean, a thought in your, you know, a thought that goes through your mind is activating many, many different parts of the brain. Um, so a couple things that, uh, that the uh, brain does, of course, it processes information, all the information in your nervous system is in your mind, okay? Um, so it's not physical. The mind isn't physical. You can't touch it, but it's still real. The brain represents your mind. All mental activity, your thoughts and feelings, joys and sorrows, requires neural activity. Now, the key thing is, is that neurons that fire together, wire together. So when you have a thought and a whole bunch of different neurons are firing together, they actually wire t together. There's actually neurons that are created. There's actually synapses that are created. And then that reinforces, the, the thought reinforces itself. So it's easier to recall later. So you can clearly see that an obsession would be continually lighting up the same parts of your brain and get stronger and stronger. So you can't break an obsession by thinking about it. You have to, you have to develop alternate brain pathways and then weaken the, the one from the obsession, if you like. Repeated patterns of brain activity change the neural structure and function. So the, the key thing is you can use your mind to change your brain to change your mind. Okay, so there's also, um, there's also all kinds of other information on the Rick Hansen site. You can take courses, etc. But I want to talk a bit more about the here, so about the anatomy of the brain, if you like, the picture of the brain. Okay, so we've got the um, spinal cord, and there's neurons in the spinal cord. So there's gray matter, if you like. Uh, there, there, there's some processing that is done in the, in the spinal cord. You know, it's an extension of your brain. It's very lowest order part. In fact, some uh, primitive creatures only have spinal cords. They don't have what's up here. Then you have the brain stem where it enters the, uh, the, 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 the vagus nerves enter the, um, enter the brain. And so this is a lower order, if you like, uh, part of the brain, okay, coming in here. And then you have these different lobes and convolutions of the brain. And the more convolutions there are, the more higher order processing that can be done. Okay, so uh, the cortex is the outermost layer of brain cells where thinking and voluntary movements begin. The brain stem, it controls breathing and sleep, some basic bodily functions. There's a basal ganglia, cluster of cells in the center of the brain, and I'll continue this 